Hello, and welcome to Baha'i Blogcast with me, your host, Rain Wilson. This is where I interview members of the Baha'i faith and other friends from all over the world about their hearts and minds and souls, their spiritual journeys, what they're interested in, and what makes them tick. Enjoy. Hello there, Baha'i Blogcast. Well, this is a very special episode. Super thrilled to be beaming this conversation into your earbones from Cottonwood, Arizona, and the Best Western Hotel, room 214, in case you want to track us down. It's across the street from the Dunkin' Donuts. And uh, I'm here with my new dear friend and Baha'i brother, Batani Wayne Wilson. We got to know each other through an interesting set of circumstances, but I'm so excited to, to be out here in Arizona, and we're going to be visiting his his work with K Native Action later tonight and tomorrow out on the Navajo Reservation, kind of between uh, Arizona and New Mexico, Four Corners area. So, um, Wayne, thanks for having me in room 214 at the uh, Best Western. It's good to be here in Cottonwood, Arizona. I just want to say thank you for allowing me to um, share in both English and Navajo. I just explained that uh, I'm a folded arms clan born for the two waters that flow together clan and bitter water is my maternal grandparent and my paternal grandparent is uh, Black Street on the Running Tree Clan and I'm originally from Pine Springs and my name is Wayne Wilson and um, I just wanted to share like um, a little bit of where I'm from, where I come from, uh, from Pine Springs. Uh, Pine Springs, uh, Pine Springs, Arizona on the Navajo Nation is, uh, uh, they, I guess, back in 1962 is where they had the first uh, night, the council fire uh, Baha'i council fire there and uh, a lot of my relatives became Baha'is at that time and um, there's like three of my uncles, they're, they're late uncles, um, there's uh, Franklin Khan, Van, the late Ben Khan and Ch- uh, the late Chester Khan, they were all uh, Baha'is before me and they were the ones that taught me about the Baha'i faith and that's kind of how I was able to I guess participate and then also um, it was part of my transition from uh, living in Pine Springs. I grew up in Pine Springs and then I used to herd sheep and I also uh, went to boarding school in Pine Springs boarding school and also um, Fort Wingate boarding school. And um, so it was mainly um, we had to do um, like uh, the Catholic, go to Catholic mass on Sunday and um, be participating in Catholicism and um, that was kind of like uh, how it was forced on me so that was I, it was kind of hard for me but then later on I, um, I decided to be a Baha'i that was like in 90, 91 around that time oh that's great and for those you know we have a lot of listeners from all over the world like what would um, as you were describing it what would a Baha'i council fire in 1962 and I grew up a Baha'i uh, kid in, in Seattle area, and I heard about the Khans, like Chester Khan, and they were kind of very well known Baha'i um, teachers and spiritual leaders. But what what would that council fire have been like? What would have happened there? I, I, I don't I know you were probably there, but what can you tell us about that event? Well, from what I've heard from uh, some uh, another uncle, Alfred Khan, and then also the photos that I've seen, there was uh, quite a few uh, people that. Uh, pioneers that came, they came in a bus and they camped out right there in Pine Springs right by the community, they call it the community center but it was like, the, the, at, back at that time it was recognized as a uh, Pine Springs chapter so they call it the old chap, uh, Pine Springs chapter building but uh, everybody camped out around that area and they all had a, um, like they all talked, had a talk and they made, um, I remember one of the highlights was uh, the women getting together and make, uh, cooking a, a cake, cornmeal cake, in the ground as part of that celebration and part of that coming together of, of that many people. I mean, I was quite, I was, I, it was over a hundred 
hundred people. There's probably about maybe close to three, four hundred people. I mean Navajo people because they were all. Um, there was a person that rode around on a horse and were telling people that you know they were invited to come to the council fire and so like I said they all camped out in the different areas. And what would have happened at the council fire? Uh, well, it was uh, to share um, the message of uh, uh, the Bob and Baha'u'llah that, that they had come to bring the message of God and to share and to, to uh, come together as uh, humanity recognizes, recognizing each other as one family and uh, the human family, of course, you know. And so that concept is kind of like um, very um, similar to the Navajo teaching and way of life and to recognize each other as family because when uh, sometimes uh, that's how the Navajo were able to keep going as far as like when um, the Navajos went on the long walk a lot of families were separated so what had happened was that I guess the clan system kicked in that uh, changing woman uh, established for the Navajo people was uh, that's the reason why we have clans we have four clans so if we if one of us goes astray and we come across another person and they're the same clan so they just automatically adopt each other so that's kind of how how it all um, how that works as far as recognizing family and that's that keh, when I was like, we talk about keh, or keh, native action the word keh is part having to do with um, a peaceful family relationship so that was what they were practicing when they came together so that's very close to how the Baha'i faith are uh, recognized and they and at that time they weren't forceful at least the way I understood it um, like for me when I, I was mentioning the, the boarding school that we had to go to the uh, church and you know uh, I think the the main part that I enjoyed was going back in, uh, in between going for the walk you know because the church was quite a ways uh, at least about maybe a quarter mile to a half mile to walk you know and then it, it, it just it was different because when I was raised up, my my family, um, my mother and my father were, they were alcoholics, and um, I just remember when I was a kid, uh, being with my brother and my sister in the car, and uh, they were parked at the, the liquor store or the bar, and we were in the back of the car, and there was there was no place. We just had to stay in the car, and until my sister wanted to go home, and she would have to go in. To tell them to come out, and we wanted to go home. So, there were several times where, I think it was like twice, we got into a car accident, and one was pretty bad because uh, my mother got hurt and almost went through the uh, window shield, the window shield of the vehicle, and she had a scar across her face. So, um, after that, my grandmother said, "No more. That's enough." You know, she told my my father that you need to go. Uh, we don't want. We don't. We don't want our, our family members to pass away. So, it just kind of like split the family, and then. But there was a lot of. I noticed there was domestic violence too. Back then, it wasn't recognized as child abuse or child neglect or you know, uh, you know, uh, domestic violence. That they, there was no such thing back then. But now, they're really. Uh, they're really on top of it. So, um, like what I, what I've seen is the, the way things are. You know, they, they really get on you for, just like leaving the child you know and then and then when when my grand well I, after that my grandmother raised me so I was raised by my grandmother my grandmother and mm -hmm. her brother grand, her, he was named he was a medicine man so his name was uh, John Burnside and he would come around and do ceremony so we would prepare the building or the Hogan for whoever was going to have a, a, a prayer or they say doings or ceremony to for that patient and what's a Hogan a hogan is a, a usually a round building or a, an octagon building, and that's where they have. Um, I guess you could say it's what the Baha'is call the or something. Majra Kal Azkar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's similar. A place to that of concept. gathering. Yeah. yeah, place of gathering, mm -hmm. ceremony, eating. You know, just to get together. So that's what that building represented for for us, and um, and the hogan is the whole. Everything's. Connected or it reflects back into the universe on when you go when you enter the Hogan you go to your left and you go clockwise because on this area or this part of the hemisphere the the way the sun uh, comes it comes to the east and it goes to, around to the south and then all the way to the west so it's all based on the different times of times of the day and 
are all based on like the spring, the summer, the fall, and the winter. So, so the east would represent the spring, and then uh, the south would represent the summer, and then the west would represent the fall, and then the north would represent the winter. So by going around in that hogan, you're acknowledging those four quadrants, and also the four the four directions and the four seasons. So that's that, and then the the fire that's in the center of the hogan represents Polaris. So when we go around in the Hogan, that's how we reflect. And um, that's how I see the like the manifestations of God and also like the Bab Mahala, how we're supposed to be reflecting back into the universe. These, the, the way we're uh, through prayer and fasting and meditation, um, we're not doing that anymore. We're kind of like straying from it. So it seemed like we're kind of like being put back onto this or the things that we're supposed to be doing, at least like when you read the writings or prayers, it kind of like gets you back on that. Uh, it's like a foundation to go by. So that's kind of how I'm, I'm understanding um, their writings and the prayers, you know. And then also looking at like uh, my own, in my own within within our own indigenous culture and our own indi through our language, it's like looking in what's what was the true. The true uh, essence of who we are as Diné or Navajo people or Five Finger Earth Surface people, and who were the holy people, you know. When we say holy people, they're they're the ones that were here before us, and they had a, they left behind a set of instructions on how to live in in beauty, balance, and harmony. That beauty, balance, and harmony is the is is in one word, and we call it Hojon, and Hojon is encompasses an all encompassing word. So it's like like the way the, the sphere of the earth or the sphere and it, how everything is going in a circle. So and hojo is part of that and then it goes extends beyond more. So it's it's a very ancient word and but it's very powerful and when we sing and um, chant, you know, like there's a word that hojo means hojo means everything in existence is beautiful. It's just that it's how we live our life. You know, are we gonna live it in beauty? Or are we gonna live it in chaos? And are we gonna be in balance? So it's the balance between the beauty and the chaos. So that's how we're living, <laughs> supposed to be living our life. At least that's the way um, my grand, my grandmother and my grandfather they explained it to me like that when I was little. Uh, that's so beautiful. And isn't there that uh, Navajo phrase about walking with beauty? Yeah. So uh, there's a prayer. Kudoho Jondo, you know, it's like saying, from here, from where I'm going, from where my next step, uh, it's going to be beautiful. So we say, Kudoho Jondo, then we say, Shidagi Hojondo, Shikere Hojondo, Shiket Ate Hojondo, Shitit Aje Teko Hojondo, Tats Hoshinago Hojondo. So what I'm saying is, from here, where, from here where I am, where I'm standing, or where I'm walking forward, it's going to be beautiful, and then it'll be beauty, beh beauty before me, beauty behind me, beauty below my feet upon Mother Earth, and then beauty above my head all the way up into the universe, and then beauty all the way around. So and then they say, all is beautiful, all is beautiful, all is beautiful. So that prayer is that brings everything together when you say that prayer. That's beautiful. And are, are there more links between the Baha'i prayers and the Navajo prayers and also wh what are the connections that that you find between the Baha'i teachings and the traditional spiritual uh, teachings of the of the Navajo well um, like I said this prayer that I'm sharing with you is very similar to the protection prayer that the Bob um, said with, with that part of immeasurably exalted art thou Lord protect us what lies in front of us behind us above our head, on our right, on our left, below our feet, and every other side we, which we are exposed. Um, that prayer is very uh, close to the prayer I just said, because we're saying beauty before me, beauty behind me. But when we say beauty, we're also mentioned, we're also uh, encompassing the protection part of it, because with um, in the Navajo teaching, Navajo philosophy, there is the, there's the male and female essence. The male represents protection and the female represents blessing. So those two go hand in hand. And what uh, ties those two together in the Navajo language, they talk about or you can say 
ba'ad. So when I'm saying those words, I'm saying long in long life, or old age, um, boy or male, masculine, and then bikahajon is that life, uh, long life, uh, beautiful, beautiful long life, girl or female essence. So it's that male female balance here on Earth. Um, that's the way everything is like these plants, the the, the uh, who we are as humanity, and then the animals. Uh, so it's uh, everything's male female. At least that's how uh, they recognize it. So when we sing those like that word, that that's where I saw for me as a Diné or an Navajo when they talk about the Bob Mahala. Um, the Bob would rep be would be San and be, and then the Bahala would be the Kahojon. You know, when you talk to uh, twin manifestations to to the elderly or people here, they don't understand. But when you say or when you say that to them, you're talking about primordial pairs. They'll understand because mm. the reason why I'm I'm saying that is the Earth and the Moon are considered to be because they follow each other all the time. You know, when you see them in the sky, mm. it, they're, mm. they're, they're two pairs. I'm talking about, uh, yes, they're actual people, but the essence behind them, or you could say the, uh, the, that part of the attributes, the male-female essence, or they say divine masculine, divine feminine. That is what I was referring to, because when you go deeper in, our, I guess you could say, our holy people, there was first calling God, there's a ceremony, this is from the nine night ceremony. There's first calling God, or they call it first house God, and then there's uh, talking God. Their name is Hashe Yatkin, Hashe Wood. Those two were here long before in our stories, and our emergent stories, they talk about them being a part of the development of the earth when it started, before humanity became came into the existence. They were here, and so they helped. Um, I guess you could say they helped the great spirit in in developing how humanity will live here on this earth. So they were here, and those two are the only two that I um, that I was really looking into. There's um, there's some people talk about monster slayer and child born in the water, who were twin twin warriors that help um, purify this land because of humanity going astray, and then uh, they were creating these. Demons, monsters, sicknesses, chaos. It, it's like it started devouring humanity, killing humanity. And they were trying to figure out, well, we have to figure out how humanity, humanity can live in beauty and harmony. So how can we do this? So that's when they um, chose a changing woman who was like our mother, uh, the mother of humanity, who then became the earth. So... Um, Changing woman has uh, two names. Uh, she had, or they call her white shell woman or uh, changing woman. But then I've heard uh, another version of them saying white shell changing woman. So she was white shell when she was a younger, from a little girl to teenage, and then from teenage growing to an older woman. So that's how she became changing woman. So it's like these different parts of the, of, of, uh, the woman when, or a woman when she becomes uh, from a childhood to teenage, then all the way to uh, old, and like an older woman. So um, they they recognize that. So that when they chose her, she raised the monster slayer child born in water, and that's how. And they were the ones that came and uh, had to uh, kill off all these monsters and make it habitable for humanity to live and to be able to be where we're at right now, I guess, for technology. So that's kind of how deep that, that it goes, you know, with the culture and yeah. and uh, recognition, the recognition of these two holy figures. Um, those two holy figures, we use them in the sand painting too. So mm. they're, but their name is Hashche But for me, I, that's how I see them. I see them as that they have their, yes, they're, they were here long before. They're still here and then they're also continuing on um, that which ties in perfectly with the Baha'i concept of progressive revelation right yeah and then uh, in the Navajo teaching they talk about emergence that we emerged from the dark world and then we merge into the blue world the yellow world then the white world then now they're saying there's the fifth world that's that was four so then there's five 
And the, fi the fifth world is considered to be the glittering world that we're in right now because everything glitters you know, <laughs> because of the technology. Mm. So they say we're, we've merged into the, the, the fifth world. So in those different worlds, there was everybody was living right, but then somewhere along the line, they started going astray. So those different worlds were destroyed either by water or fire or air or, you know, something more catastrophic. Um, and then, of course, you know, the, the, the Pangea separated. And so all these, the, you have the different countries and then it's, they're all on different sides of the hemisphere. So that's kind of how I'm understanding. And then, you know, how it goes, but our stories go pretty far back. I, I, that's, I just, I just um, share the similarities with um, how I see the Bob and Baha'u'llah as to ha save a first calling God and first talking God. So it's there, I, um, I guess the, when I talk about Aketna Ashe, or Nakina Ashe, Aketna Ashe means one who goes, for, they both travel together like that. So, um, that that's what I'm, I'm talking about. And then the other one is Nakina Ashe means they're coming in pairs, so they're considered to be primordial pairs. Mm. Um, and so it's not just like that for for the Neb. There's other uh, cultures that I I've looked and I said, wow, it's amazing to see that Indian India, the East India, they have their own two brothers, warrior brothers, and then mm. the Mayans and the Aztec, they have their own two warrior brothers. So it's like they have these primordial pairs all around the world. Wow, so. wow, that is, yeah, that that goes into a deep spiritual mythology. I know that you've done some work with the, the great Baha'i scholar Christopher Buck, uh, who we have to get on the show here one of these days, and um, and Kevin Locke has also worked with Christopher Buck, kind of, and on a lot of writings on Baha'i teachings and on Wil Wilmette Institute about the ways that uh, Native, indigenous, uh, spiritual traditions line up with uh, some of these uh, core Baha'i teachings and beliefs, especially around progressive revelation and just the, the the writings, legends, and incredible wisdom of these great spiritual teachers that have come through all the different you know regions and tribes and and areas of um, Native uh, North America throughout the millennia. What whatever what else have your has your studies? Uh, around that unearthed so when I, I I know like with Christopher Buck he did a um, introductory an introduction and then we started getting into talking about indigenous uh, spiritual teachers manifestations of uh, you know manifestations of God so yeah we got into that and uh, that's what I was sharing with him and what I just shared with you about mm. these uh, two holy figures that are are ancient from way back, and then it's it's amazing to see that even now to this day, they still uh, recognize them, but they have a different name, but they they're still the same station. At least that's kind of how I'm viewing it. And so when we talk about pro progressive revelation, um, you got the mineral kingdom, then the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, the human kingdom, and then there's the spirit. So in those through that. I guess that's part of the, the um, for us we say emergence, because in the dark world we were we emerged from the darkness and coming in, gradually coming into the light. So it's like the dark world would be the, the, the mineral, and then it'll be like as you go from the plant to the uh, uh, animal, and then the human. So that's 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 kind of how we evolved in, the, in that way. So. Some of them say well, it's part of Darwinism, but it's like it's little. <laughs> but we we didn't come from apes, you know. We're actually human people, because we're the only people that can communicate through language, and uh, we have our own phenomena, <laughs> uh, um, how we think, our conscious and subconscious. Um, mm -hmm. It's very very unique from the other, like the uh, insects and then the, also the animals. Mm. So that's kind of how. Uh, at least that's the way it was expressed to me. So I don't know if I answered all. No, you did. That's that's great. And you know, we started this interview and we went right into um, some pretty deep philosophical and spiritual concepts. Thank you for sharing that. And I love that. Uh, I have to look more into that idea of the, the, the twin warriors and the twin brothers and yeah. kind of, you know, in various spiritual traditions and mythology and 
on how that aligns with the Bob and Baha'u'llah. That's really, I've never heard that before. It's really cool. But let's go back because you talked about growing up and herding sheep yeah. on the reservation. I'd just love to know a little bit more about you personally, Wayne, <laughs> and growing up there. Um, what was it? Pine, Pine Springs. Pine Springs. And um, just tell me about your life. You, you shared that kind of really painful chapter about growing up in an alcoholic family, but I'd love to know kind of where your life journey took you and you know how you got here and then eventually we'll get more into k native action and and this incredible service work that you've been doing but first i want to just get to know you a little better okay well you know i uh like i said um back in 1980 and then 90 that's when i was herding sheep and i lived my when my parents passed away and then my uh was even my my grandma passed away she was like a parent to me. And then my mother, I was like, first it was my grandmother who passed away, then it was my mother, then my father. So it's like from, I think it was 76 to 1980. It was in that time span, that's when they passed away. But then I was raised with um, my aunt, um, Elizabeth Bennett and Robert Bennett. They raised me and then I had, uh, they had their, their, their kids, which were my cousins. and. Uh, that was very painful because I went through abuse from from uh, one particular person, but I it's taken a long time. So I didn't really feel part of that, like that was a part of that family. The, the herd, I herded sheep um, and helped feed the horses and the cows, and um, and then I went to school in Sanders um, Ele Sanders Elementary, and then also. Um, um, Valley High School, and that's where I graduated in Sanders. And then the, I used to go to the Native American Baha'i Institute, which is also, they call it NABI. And um, that's when um, Ben Khan, the late Ben Khan, and Chester Khan used to come around and they, they built, uh, help build that place. And uh, Lorraine Khan, who was also an admin administrator um, to who oversaw the Native American Baha'i Institute, um, Jeff Kiley. Um, so part of my, uh, what happened to me was I, I was with my cousin and we, we were, he was really, he was an, I guess you could say he was an, uh, an alcoholic, but he was Baha'i. So I was trying to tell him we needed to, you know, start looking more into the faith, but it seemed like he was being pulled away. So, um... One day, him and I, we were drinking, I got out. I just told him I wanted to get out and go to the, I just wanted to get out and he wouldn't let me out. So I was proceeding to get out of the vehicle while it was still moving. <laughs> and then he just slammed on the brake and I got out. He tried to give me another beer. I said, no, I don't want it, I'm done. So I left and I got out and I started walking down the road. And then I not knowing what time of day it was. And then um, I ended up, of course, I ended up uh, walking over to the Native American Baha'i Institute. And so, that's where everything started, uh, going the opposite direction as far as um, living a, a party in life and, mm -hmm. and a carefree life. So, uh, and then I started, uh, I went to the Baha'i Institute and talked to, um, Jeff Kiley was there at the time, and he told me, well, we don't let people sleep here, but you know, you can stay over at the prayer hogan. So I went to the prayer hogan and I stayed the night, but when I was there, I prayed, I prayed about all the things that I'm going through. And, what, what you know where I'm at and just let it all go and um, next thing you know I was uh, kind of like straightening straighten myself out and cleaning myself up and making sure you know uh, I said you know from here on I got to start uh, figure out what I need to do so um, it was like a year a year went by and I was working on myself and my sobriety and then um, I uh, started helping there at the Native American Baha'i Institute. They were talking about service, how you do service. And I didn't understand what service, but then I, uh, the very first um, AA that I went to was there at the, the, the Prayer Hogan. It was all done in Navajo. Was the most unique thing that I ever saw was this, to go through the 12-step program all in Navajo. Wow. I have never seen, I never seen it happen anywhere else but there. So, wow. There's a guy. Is, named, the, is the big book translated into Navajo? <laughs> um, well, actually, the, it was all in English, but our whole conversation that we had was all in Navajo. Mm. So they were 
So we would read the scripture in English, and then we would like kind of like deepen on it in Navajo. So yeah. our response would be in Navajo on what they're actually saying about, mm. you know, with the 12-step program. Mm. So it was very, very interesting. And then my uncle attended that meeting. He was a Navajo code talker, original. One, one of the uh, wow, program. yeah, his name was. And Luke. for people that don't know about the Navajo Code Talkers, can you tell them a little uh, bit about that? Okay, well, the Navajo Code Talker, like my uncle Wilsey Bitsy was his name. Um, he uh, he was a clerk, one of the clerk of the codes, and so they use uh, the Navajo language in the Pacific War um, as they were going from the one island to the next island. So. They were using the Navajo language uh, on the radio wave to relay messages so that the Japanese or whoever wouldn't cipher the information. And so they were using the Navajo language back and forth to, um, to share who, who's, where they're at, their location, and um, also the coordinates of where they were shooting the, the mortars so they, be, so they wouldn't be shooting them, uh, on their own people. On the, um, yeah, you know the own, their own army, so mm -hmm. they were being successful using the Navajo language. Okay, so that's how they, that's how the Navajo code. So my uncle was one of them, Navajo code talker, and uh, he's the one. He played a major role. So he was there at that AA meeting, and then also, I, from there on, we started to get to know each other more and more, and he also helped me get into the powwow, dancing in the powwow. So. Mm. Uh, uh, he just told me there's a lot of things going to be happening to you, so you have to be aware of these. He kind of gave me a, a heads up on all and all, and everything that he was telling me has started falling into place. Like um, to get a, a whole eagle, you know, a golden eagle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and, and he he prayed about me going to Michigan, uh, going to school. He he told me he went to school in Ann Arbor, got his degree, and so he was telling me that uh, that Michigan. He's he's been to Michigan, so uh, it was interesting you know, being with him. We'll see Bitsy. He 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 played a uh, he was like a spiritual guide in some to some extent. He was like an elder, so mm. he shared a lot. And so I used to help him out all the time. You know, take him drive him to places, uh, take him, you know, get food for him. Or so I, um, that whole part I was sharing about service. I started learning through AA that when you serve people. It kind of helps you out, and then it helps them out. So, um, and then he also explained that how that process worked. You know, my uncle Wilsey, he explained how the pro you. This is why you help people. So when you need help, then somebody will help you. So um, that's kind of how far this service thing goes. And then um, uh, and with like in the faith, they they talk about doing service. You know, whatever if it's cleaning somebody's yard or digging a hole for an mm -hmm. outhouse or just doing whatever, you know, cleaning, cleaning for them. Work in the spirit of service is, yeah. the, is the highest worship. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't realize it until now. I understand now more and more about what service is more. And so, but when I started uh, a year ago, when the pandemic, was, when they said it's a pandemic, that's where um, I was already, I already had the food because something kept telling me I had a, instinct something mm -hmm. tell me there you need to start saving food so i i had in the, our apartment where it was stacks of cases of food and i was like man i gotta get rid of this food i gotta figure out who needs it so i started going around and i was giving it out and then all of a sudden they said it's a pandemic and so i said oh no here we go this is gonna <laughs> it's gonna get bigger there's gonna be more people so i went back to the uh saint mary's uh food bank in albuquerque and i started getting more food and and then uh, uh, some just told me I uh, need to start getting more items like uh, men and women's uh, personal hygiene products and cleaning supplies, you know, um, food, more food, uh, at least non-perishable foods. So that's kind of how, I, and then the whole issue of water, how, how they were saying you need to wash your hands. And I was like, well, there's people out there that don't have running water and, and, and they have to haul their water. And so I was like, wow, it's getting more and more challenging. So. I decided well, well I started. We started with uh, giving out water, uh, cases of water, and then we switched from that to um, um, hauling water. And then they didn't. Some people, they, all they had were five gallon buckets or the five gallon containers. So uh, um, that's where um, we decided to get into barrels and distributing out uh, five fifty five gallon barrels 
or 60 gallons, 30 gallons, uh, 15 gallons, all the way down to five gallon. So it's like we were um, through Accomplice and then also with Kelly, uh, Kelly Beck from New Jersey. Well, this, we, the, we've got to acknowledge the fact that Kelly Beck from New Jersey <laughs> yeah. is sitting in the corner of this. Of this. Say hi, Kelly. Hello. <laughs> Brooklyn, by the way, Brooklyn, Brooklyn. Okay. Um, but close. Not New Jersey? Not New Jersey. Yeah, no cool. offense, New Jersey. It's Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah, so she helped us and we were able to, uh, with, uh, what was uh, Olga's? Um, Antinaco. Uh, Ant yeah, Antinaco. 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 Um, there's a couple others that she runs, right? It's a nonprofit. But anyway, there's we started uh, collaborating, and then I started collaborating with uh, uh, Chris from... Uh, yeah, that's how I met you, was Chris Cullen from yeah. Seattle, who does a lot of work with Native peoples, and he kept telling me about, oh, you got to meet this guy, Wayne Wilson. I'm telling you, you just got to meet this guy. <laughs> he just spends all his time being of service, hauling water. Um, you know, he's... He, he talked about Kelly, like they're starting a thing, you gotta help them out. And so that's how I got to know you. We did a big online fundraiser to, to get you a truck to be able to haul this water out to some remote locations. Yeah. Uh, and that's why we're here to visit you and yeah. check out some of your work, deliver some food, <laughs> and, um, and hang out at the Best Western. <laughs> so so the, uh, that's, that's kind of how um, this has all been working. There's a lot of other people that were involved that, um, that have donated. There's just so many uh, people I, I think about. There's several groups, like there's the, um, Christopher Cullen, and there's, there's a group from Cal two groups from California that donated. There's, uh, there's several. I just so many people. And then, of course, there's you that uh, helped, you know, and then... Um, then just uh, other people like uh, there's some in other Navajos that pitched in and helped um, as far as like going out and I was trying to what I was trying to do is collaborate with, with all these different groups so right now we've been working with Flagstaff Mutual Aid from Flagstaff and what was the other one it was Navajo Medicine Healers they, they uh, it's, a, it's a group that they, they only deliver to the uh, medicine men or people that are do the ceremony um, they have their family so I kind of saw how <laughs> where they're at so and then uh, part of the, what we're doing too is testing the water because mm -hmm. uh, there's families out there that are using livestock water for I mean windmills water pumps and so what we've been doing is testing them to see what the level is from one to six so if it's and some of the water has been polluted from a lot of the uranium mining. Is that right? Yeah. And mining and on the on the reservation. Yeah, there's um, there's the uranium mining, and and then there's also the coal mining. Now, today they're doing the, um, the fracking. Fracking, yeah. That's the and, the and the chemicals they use to put back into the ground is going into the springs. That's what they're really worried about. The animals are worried about the, uh, those chemicals going into the spring water. So, yeah, that's that's kind of those are some of the challenges, and then also I just got on my on now I'm, uh, my my second shot, so I got myself. Uh, you're not you're inoculated. inoculated okay. Yeah. So I'm doing I'm doing good now. I'm doing better. Uh, it's been a challenge though. Uh, it's been very stressful, but I just kept going, when I'm plugging away, plugging away, just keep going. You know, I said, let's go as long as I can. I was I even risked myself. You know, there's a couple of times that we had to deliver to people that were infected by COVID. And it just kind of just took precautions. Our procedure would be, our method would be, put a table out and we'll um, give you the, your supplies and then you can wipe them down. But now there's the group, there's, we, they, they usually wipe them down before we give it to them. But I usually tell them, well, you can, you can wipe it down, you know, before you use it, use yeah. whatever food, packages. And COVID hit the Navajo reservation uh, maybe the worst in the United States. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, there's. it's because um, families, uh, like on the Navajo Nation, they, we all live in um, clustered housings. And so the families are really tight-knit because, like I said, it's like a clan. We all live in close community. If it's a big family, they're all in one area. Like when, we, when I went out to one particular place, uh, away from the main community, there was a whole another community. And there was like over, what, 
10, I don't know, about 20, 30 people all living in one area. So it's so if one person gets sick, then they don't even know. They just uh, pass it on, whether if it's like talking or touching, you know, uh, shaking hands. I mean, like, that was the hard part is not shake, being able to shake someone's hand because that's how you, you, you're you respectful to your elder by shaking. So they, it's hard because they want to stick their hand out, but then they don't want to. They think about it and they say, "Oh, we can't shake hands, or we can't come together, as a uh, uh, as we did before. Like we get together and have a meal and you know have a conversation and all. We can't do that anymore." So, and a lot of these uh, deliveries that you do, I was interested to find out that a good third uh, of the reservation population kind of live off the grid. Yeah. So there's families out there that don't have uh, running water. Or they don't have um, electricity. Um, they don't. Some there's some that don't have cars. They usually catch a ride. They use the extended family to give them uh, a ride, or they'll bring food back for them. But there's there's just some that they're they don't have no income. It's tough out there, <laughs> cause I, I I was one of those people. I was I was on foot for a while, you know, for a long while. But now and then I I have had like several vehicles, but one of them even caught on fire. <laughs> so yeah, the motor caught on fire. So uh, um, then I was on foot. So I just been praying. I I pray every day and try to give my offerings, and um, and that's that's pretty much what I've been doing. And then also helping the elderly. Usually, um, if they need firewood, I'll get them firewood. If they need their wood split, we'll split it for them. Or if they, you know, if there's their logs are too long, and they need a certain length, we just cut it for them right there, and then split it right there. So um, through uh, Christopher Cullen, he ended up giving us a wood splitter and made it uh, faster. You know, to oh, cut great. More, yeah. more wood, and then also he helped with uh, uh, obtaining a, a flatbed trailer, so uh, we can put the wood on there and haul wood and water and food at the same time, all in one, all in one shop. That's what we, there's several times we did that. <laughs> That's great. And Kelly, come over here closer to the mic, will you, just for a second, say hi. Um, how'd you get involved with Wayne and uh, tell us about uh, your work helping kind of set up and organize K Native Action? Um, it's the power of saying yes. So I saw um, a post on Facebook just at the beginning of the pandemic asking if somebody was interested in driving supplies from New Jersey, there's the New Jersey, um, out to Gallup, New Mexico. And I said, oh, I know how to drive. I can do that. And so I ended up hauling water barrels, um, household supplies, um, food and other um, items. My daughter and I drove out. We met Wayne and we followed him around for a day and we delivered five barrels to five households. We traveled 267 miles that day. So that's how vast and isolated a lot of these places were. And um, it was remarkable work. It was important work. And I discovered that we all have a role that we can play. And once I met Wayne and once I saw the work that he was doing, it was impossible for me to not continue to, um, to support him and his service to the people. Mm -hmm. And so we started Accomplice. And um, an Accomplice is really like, we need to be more than allies. We need to drive the getaway car sometimes, right? And so I'm, I'm just here as a vessel for him to fill and for him to distribute. And the power of what you did as well, Rain, is just to, you know, to open the floodgates for all kinds of people all over the place to just say yes. And sometimes that yes is just 10 bucks, 15 bucks, um, and it makes a difference. It really does. So it's been um, an honor, uh, truly an honor to be able to be a part of K Native Action. And, and, support and what is what exactly is Accomplice? Accomplice is um, a grant making nonprofit, social justice focused. We work with 
reparations and restoration. Um, we work with Native communities and we work with Black communities. Community-led organizers, um, we're out of the way. It's direct giving. It's individuals who have seen a need in their community. They self-organize and they say, I know what needs to be done and I'm going to do it. And so they're loose groups. They don't have a lot of structure, but they have a lot of knowledge and a lot of experience and a lot of love for the people that they serve. And so we're just trying to um, return resources to those communities and build capacity for people doing work on the ground. So that's great. It's beautiful. So what's next in the life of Batani Wayne Wilson and K Native Action? Well, I wanted to, this K Native Action, I was hoping that it will eventually merge into helping people as far as like the relief and then also uh, humanitarian aid. Because on the Navajo Nation, we, I was, uh, when I was working for, this is part of, uh, you, were at, you asked me to share, I was part of the chapter which is uh, it's a governing body that looks over the community and then there's a council person uh, from the main council he comes into these chapter meetings and then he goes to the council and shares with the council on, in Windrock the main uh, capital is it, so it's interesting how it's like senators and congressmen congressmen or? yeah mm -hmm. so they go back and report so when I was a part of this chapter I was on Club C which is community land use planning under the community development of the Navajo Nation. So they held an emergency, through the emergency management program, they held a, um, like a conference and all the Club C had to go there, um, the head officers had to go there. So when I was there, they talked about all these things about that could happen, like uh, emerg any emergency situation, um, chemical spills, earthquakes, whatever, um, nuclear war, whatever. So they were saying we need to each community needs to be prepared. They need to save extra water, they need to save first aid kits, extra food, extra blanket, generators, batteries. Oh man, there's just a whole list. And then they said if you need to, you gotta go back to FEMA. Mm -hmm. So to uh, every community needs to start saving. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, at least gather it up. And then if they're diabetics and or they have this uh, sicknesses, they have to have at least two weeks worth of extra medication or you know yeah. food whatever so they were, they were supposed to store it up but what had happened was that it only we I went to this training program so all these communities nobody did nothing so mm -hmm. and, and so I was one of those people so I said wait a minute I went to this training and they told me you know so all these things started kicking in then you know like just get the water you know so water was the main one that I chose to water and food. So, yeah. So it was just one thing after another. Then it's like, okay, water. And now we need stuff to put water in, like the barrels. So it's just started building from there. So that, as a result from all that, going through that training, this is where, where I'm at now. And then where I'm going is I would like to have uh, at least the Navajo Nation to every community. That's what I've been going around telling them. You know, there was a training that happened, and all you people need to start saving extra food, extra water, you know. Yeah, yeah. So In preparation. Yeah, because we don't know. We don't know what's going to happen. We certainly do not. We don't, we don't even know. It looked like COVID was kind of going away for a while, and now it's flaring up kind of worse than ever. So who knows what God's plan yeah. is. Yeah. So I'm just trying to help that much more, you know. Yeah. At least uh, that the family that I come from, that's my grandmother was that way. And my grandfather, you know, he was a medicine man, like I'll say. His name was John Burnside. Uh, he was a really, really nice man. And he used to, he shared me some of, like, some of the things like with the herbs and then also the chants and the prayers. Yeah. Uh, I don't go around telling people I do ceremony, but I've helped here and there, um, especially with the sand painting doing the sand painting oh beautiful yeah. so that whole concept was that's it's a uh, powerful too because when you uh, doing sand painting it's a visual prayer and so the patient sits wow. on that sand painting mm. and so it absorbs that essence from the sand painting so they, they get then they get bathed right there too well so you make a healing sand painting yeah. on the ground yeah. and then the patient 
sits on it yeah. to kind of interact with the prayer, a visual prayer yeah. in a different way. Yeah, at the same time, they're hearing it. The medicine mm. man's chanting the prayer. Oh, they're chanting the prayer that's yeah. also painted on the yeah. ground. Wow. And then they're administering them the herb, the antidote for the sickness. Oh, wow. Whether it means bathing them yeah. right there or they're take, at the same time they're drinking that herb. So it's all in one compass. Wonderful. And you're you're on Facebook, right? Yeah, Wayne? I'm on Facebook. What, and what what's your on your name on Facebook? Uh, Bethany Wayne Wilson. B I T A H N I I Wayne Wilson. W A Y. Great. We'll put a link there too so people can kind of follow you and we'll be looking for a ongoing growing online presence for K Native Action as and well. Also K Native Action at uh, knativeaction.com as uh, you can uh, uh, dot org dot org yeah okay great yeah. we'll we'll put a link here in the in the podcast can you take us out Wayne with a prayer um, would love to hear I mean the Navajo language is so ancient and beautiful and powerful um, uh, do you know any Baha'i prayers in in Navajo or um, a, a Navajo prayer that kind of Connects with the uh, with the Baha'i spirit. Okay, I'll um, say two prayers. Um, say one and just the Navajo prayer and then the, the Baha'i prayer. All right. Kudo hajono le shidin li ni shidhadi en li ni kona. Nda kon ha a habin ha yal ka shada a ahe shi hos dogole e ahe ji cha ahe kle na ho kosi asin sa na san shmado yadu shi shija shidhadi en li ni kona. Nda consis na jin so zito go sleep the bend side. Huh, Joe Lido, the snout of the clean home. I'll throw the in the end on a cleaning has she yelled here as she won you'll go in our son. Now, son, not lay home yet, and as I know, top of the chin. I'll throw the in the end on a cleaning home, citizen Benachi Benachi. Citizen Abe Bedes the old corner. I'll throw Abe, he get me in on her hand yard of home. She de in, she de in, but scared how de in the deal de in yard any. Dean Hon Hojon, Yard El Hon, she daggy Hojon, or she carry Hojon, or she see Daja Hojon, or the Alt Hoshinago Hojon, or she had the in Lini, and spars and artish no consideration been a baby been a yell con, though a baby been a honey or con, Alt Hon. A care and the traditional con, a baby Hojon, she deen, she deen, she a yo oatner, she jay in his, ya and the car, she jay in his, Hon, a baby nationally. Thank you. So I just said a prayer about the holy people um, saying to the east where the sun rises to the south, where the warmth and the summer is to the west, to where the sun sets and the fall begins and then to the north where it's cold in the winter and the darkness is, and then uh, Mother Earth and Father Sky and everything else and uh, in it, who we are. And then um, may it be beautiful before us and behind us, below our feet, above our head, all the way around. All is beautiful, all is beautiful. And then I said, I, mentioned, I said uh, the Bob's Prayer, which is Diyin, uh, Shadiyin. So I'm saying, Oh God, my God, my heaven, my heart's desire. My beloved, my heaven, my heart's desire. Mm, mm. Bob. So, mm. so we said, Diyin, Shadiyin. She, Ya Anaka, Ya is heaven. Shijihin is in my heart's desire. Yeah. Mm. The Bob's prayer. So. Beautiful. Wayne, I think there was another uh, chant you wanted to share. So this chant that I'm sharing with you is, um, it says, Ta'al means all existence is beautiful. So Ta'al Tsukhojo was the, the male essence and the female essence, like I was sharing. So it goes, uh, Hojon, <laughs> 
So it's saying all is, all is beautiful, all existence is beautiful with the white corn and the yellow corn together, all is beautiful through um, the male um, old age and long life girl, the male and female, through that we're walking in beauty and then all existence is beautiful and then through the corn pollen, all existence is beautiful because it's the two that come together that makes uh, the corn and then when the corn grows it's all the way from the bottom of hardship to enlightenment to the corn pollen that's what the corn pollen is ultimate enlightenment so that's what we have to become so we can travel across the universe and be replanted somewhere else that's that whole concept of while walking in beauty living in beauty and being in existence in beauty so it's interesting how everything comes together you know how we're all trying to work to build to something better, better, bettering ourselves, or who we are. So. Batani Ween Wilson, thank you so much for your story, and thank you for your incredible service work. Kelly, thanks for joining us here today and helping out Wayne and, and letting us know what you're up to, too. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Baha'i Blogcast. Hope you enjoyed the episode and the conversation. Check out more fun Baha'i stuff on Baha'iblog.net. Thank you so much, and good night.